Well, good morning, everybody. Are we on here? Test, test. My name is Pastor Drew Frisby, and I'm so happy to see you all today. Um, today, we have a couple of special things that are happening. You may notice we've got some rainbows up here. Uh, we're going to have a special, uh, a special fellowship time after the service to celebrate our Reconciling Ministries uh, celebration of, of we're going to be raising money for a new banner, I believe, and also for uh, sending a donation to sort of the parent organization, the Reconciling Ministries Network, that helps to resource uh, churches like ours who are seeking to be open and affirming and incredibly inclusive to all people. Um, so that's, that's coming up today. There's going to be ice cream. There's going to be an ice cream social. So I hope you'll stick around and eat ice cream. We'll, we'll, we'll turn the heat up so you don't get too cold. <clears throat> As uh, my, my two-year-old says, you know, make sure you don't get a, a freeze brain. <laughs> uh, um, so that should be a lot of fun. And uh, in the fellowship hall, we also have some cards that are for folks who are shut in, folks who have a hard time getting out. And so if you have not had a chance to sign one of those cards yet, please do so. They're in the back of the fellowship hall. Um, and we'll make sure we get those sent out. Those are for uh, the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, <clears throat> the other thing, one of the requirements of, well, I don't know if it's really a requirement, but it's a common practice among churches that become reconciling congregations, uh, which we did this last spring, is that we want to be known by not just our community, but we want to make sure that we spread the word uh, wider so that the reconciling ministries, other churches that are reconciling, can, can celebrate with us and and lift us up in prayer and support. And so one of the ways we do that is we'll take a uh, sort of a silly selfie together. And so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna come up here <clears throat> and I'm hoping that everybody else who's not, you guys who are out here, you guys in the nursery, everybody in the, the sound booth, we're gonna kind of try to squeeze together a little bit so that everybody can be seen. All right. So everybody, you know, wave your hands so that it looks like there's a lot of us, you know. All right, do we have everybody in there? Tom and Jim, you guys need to scoot in. There we go. All right. All right, everybody say, everybody's welcome. Everybody's welcome. Very good. Thank you all. Thank you all for humoring me. And so part of the benefit of doing that, we'll put that, uh, we'll send that to Reconciling Ministries they'll share that widely on their uh on their facebook page which will go out to anybody who's searching for a reconciling church on their website and so then they'll be able to find us on a database of churches that are open and affirming and welcoming to the lgbtqi community so <clears throat> did i miss anything else are we uh are we ready to get rolling here yes Yes, Pat is here. Hi, Pat. Yes, I want to I want to say thank you to everybody who's on that committee, the Reconciling Ministries Committee. It's been a long time coming uh, to get to this point, um, and you all deserve a big round of applause for your your hard work. Friends, let's prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. This is the day the Lord has made. 
Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Would you please rise as you're able for our call to worship? Children of God, when wars and rumors of wars circle all around, Jesus says, Do, do not be alarmed. This, this is, is not the end. end. When earthquakes, hurricanes, fires, famines, and floods produce chaos and destruction, Jesus says, Do, do not, not be alarmed. alarmed. This, this is, is not, not the end. end. When misinformation and disinformation try to dismantle relationships of trust, in our families, churches, cities, and nations, Jesus says, do, do not, not be alarmed. alarmed. This, this is, is not, not the end. end. Children of God, whatever leaves you feeling unsteady, insecure, scared, and confused today, do not be alarmed. This is not the end. We, we come, come to worship God, God who inscribes our ending, our, our beginning, beginning and, and everything, everything in between in love. In love. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Amen. We'll start with our song. It's coming from the worship and song songbook. It'll also be on the screens, number 3152. Let's walk together for a while and ask where we begin to build a world where love can grow and hope can enter in to be the hands of healing and to plant the seeds
Friends, will you share the peace of Christ with one another? Say the word ice cream and that it really works. Friends, I've got a story for the kids. We have some kids that want to come up. Hello, Ann. Come on over. Oh. Adam, how you been? Good? It's good to see you. Well, do you guys like games? Okay. What's that? You like fishes game, like the game where you try to catch the fish? Yeah. Anybody else like that game where you try to catch fish? That's a good game. So I, I want to teach you guys a game. I think you guys might know it. It's called Simon Says. You guys know Simon Says? Okay, so the way this works, Loan, is I'm going to say some, some commands. I'll say, Simon says, pat your head. And if I do that, if I say, Simon says, pat your head, then everybody pats their head. Okay? And if I just say, rub your nose, we don't rub our nose because I didn't say, Simon says. Because the rule is, you got to listen really carefully for the Simon Says part. Okay? Y'all want to try it? Okay. Simon Says, yell amen. 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 Simon Says, give somebody a high five. Everybody touch your toes. Oh, no. Oh, no. Simon says, pat your tummy. Simon says, uh, bock like a chicken. Simon says, everybody look to your left. Look to your right. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> so, okay, so we're gonna push pause on the game for a moment. So, when, when I'm telling you those things, I'm trying to trick you, right? I'm trying to get you to think I'm telling you the right thing and then I'm gonna tell you the wrong thing and see how many people I can, I can trick. Right? Well, that's something that Jesus never does. In his whole, all the stories about Jesus, he never tries to trick anybody. He always tells people the truth. He always, you know, says loving things. He, he doesn't always say the thing that's uh, very popular. Sometimes he says things that people don't like. 
but he always speaks the truth. And so one of the things that, that I think is important for you guys is, you know, you're learning about the Bible, you're learning about becoming a Christian, and, and I think this is true for all of us, is that there are, there are going to be times when you're going to have to figure out with your brain if something somebody tells you is Christ-like or not. So if we were to replace Simon says with Jesus says, do you think that you could figure out which ones are, are more like Jesus and which ones are not? So if I were to say, so we're going we're gonna to change the game. So if, if what I say is, uh, is something that you think that Jesus would say, raise your hand, okay? So if I say, um, Jesus says, love your neighbor, raise your hand, right? Uh, if I say, uh, Jesus says, help people who are less fortunate than you, okay? What if I say, uh, Jesus says that it's okay to hate your enemies, right? That's not, that's not something Jesus would say, all right? And so we have to, we have to be able to, to distinguish those things because there are going to be people, you know, who are going to be trying to use the Bible and, you know, you'll, you'll see this. There's a lot of different brands of Christianity. There's a lot of different ways that people read the Bible. And we get to use our brains and say, is this something that sounds like Jesus? And if it's not, then maybe it's not something we want to, we want to try to follow. Okay. So one of the things that Jesus says is that we're called to love our enemies, right? Yeah. Jesus says that. Jesus says that, um, that the kingdom of God says that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. That's another one that Jesus says. You know what else Jesus says? Jesus says, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, come acting like a child. It's something he says. Yeah, he says, come as a child. Yeah, Lowen likes those pumpkins, doesn't he? So I want you guys to remember this, that just because somebody tells you something, you get to use your brain, okay? So if you hear something in this church or another place, and, and it doesn't sound like something that Jesus would say, it's okay to use your brain and say, I don't know about that one. I don't know if Jesus would say that or not. You know, and it's, it's important. It's important for us to use our brains and to, and to you know, if, if you have a question about that, ask, ask your mom or dad or another trusted adult or, or your pastor or, you know, one of these folks out here. And I think it's important that we support each other in that because there, there are times people will say, well, you know, God says, and they'll, they'll say something, but it's not actually in the Bible. You ever hear that, anybody? Like, um, what's, what's an example? Um, love the sinner, hate the sin. You ever hear that? Yeah, that's not in the Bible. So there, there are things like that, that, you know, what Jesus would say is love people. Love people. Okay? So thank you guys for coming up. Thank you guys for playing a game with me. I appreciate that. And I think we have Sunday school today. Is that right? All right. Okay. Thank you guys. Can you help me with that one?
Today's scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13. In this passage, uh, Jesus declares an apocalyptic prophecy. Apocalypse being the prediction of the end time, the end of the world. An apocalyptic message is often scary and depressing, and certainly part of the message Jesus has in this passage is scary, and for people probably depressing, but he alters that prediction by tagging on the end a metaphor, an uplifting message, the metaphor of a woman giving birth. So the end times leading to a new creation. So reading from Mark chapter 13, as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, look teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another, all will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will this be and what will be the sign that all of these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars, rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Will you pray with me? Abba, Father, Mother, God, we are so thankful to be gathering in this place. We are seeking a glimmer of hope. We are seeking to gain a greater understanding of the way that your Holy Spirit is moving in our midst. Oh God, we ask that you would, would help us to center our hearts in this place, would help us to extend our love and our, our circle of caring to those who, who might not be inside that circle yet. Oh God, for all of those words that I'm about to speak and all of the meditations of all of our hearts. We pray that they would be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, it is good to be here with you again, as always. Um, when I was a little bit younger, not so much younger, but a little bit younger, one of, my, one of my guilty pleasures was to watch or read or either read books or watch shows or, or movies that, that feature different types of, of apocalyptic um, events. You can probably you know, think of some that have been very prominent in, you know, in media over the last couple of years. Um, I think, you know, on some level, it just seems so far-fetched, all of these things. And I think about uh, what was the famous Bruce Willis one years ago where they go and try to blow up an asteroid or something, you know. Armageddon. Armageddon, that was, yeah, and then, yeah, there are all these different wild ones like that. Um, it, it seemed like there was so much distance between us and all of those sorts of things. Um, that those very, the, the writers of those sorts of 
shows or, or, or books or movies, they really, they try to play on our very human fears about these apocalyptic moments. The exact type of disaster that the characters faced wasn't really the point for me anyway, whether it was zombies or asteroids or wars or drought or you name it. The thing that really interested me as I watched or read those things was do the, how do the people react to those bad situations? How do they respond? Do they turn to evil? Do they try to pretend like nothing has happened and just kind of keep on going? Or do they find a way to lean into community and build in a new way to care for those who are most vulnerable among them? It's interesting how different artists have portrayed this through the years. I think it was, I enjoyed those, those sorts of things to a degree up until about the pandemic. And then it stopped being entertaining. Um, I remember, so when the pandemic hit years ago, we didn't really understand what was happening at first. And I, and I was serving as a youth and family pastor and a contemporary worship coordinator for the United Methodist Church up in Anacortes. And we were planning a, a Lenten soup and bread supper followed by a choir practice that night. And that was the day we got word from the bishop's office, as you all did, I'm sure here, that everything had to shut down. And it was a good thing we did because up there we had church members who were part of that infamous Skagit Valley Corral that you all read about in the New York Times. That first big super spreader event that got publicized in Washington. Churches had to become very nimble all of a sudden. Do you remember that? We had to make decisions quickly. We had to we had to think about new priorities and how we cared for those amongst us who were most vulnerable. As Jesus calls them, the least of these. Somewhere along the line, I guess I just, I lost my appetite for those sorts of apocalyptic shows and movies. <clears throat> Maybe it was the empty shelves at the local grocery store where the toilet paper and the dried goods used to be. <laughs> Or maybe it was the previous administration that at the time floated some unhelpful pieces of advice, such as drinking bleach. Don't do that, by the way. It's not a good idea. Again, you know, use your brain. You got, we got we to gotta vet some of these things that people tell us. And the images that I remember seeing of those temporary morgues in the, um, at the hospitals, in the parking lots. That image is something that I think will stay with me forever. In the midst of these difficult seasons of our lives, communities like this one, like the church up in Anacortes where I was, we found new ways to come together we realized just how much we needed the experience of worshiping and singing together. Did you all miss singing for a while? Oh my gosh. It was like, I was, I was going through a certain amount of like withdrawal from singing with, with folks. You know, I, I would sing with my own family. We, we created these videos with the, we called them the Frisbee family band videos and we would, Back then when Ellis was about three years old and we'd, you know, we'd make little videos and he would create chaos in the background and we'd send it out to the church and everybody would smile and it was fine, but it wasn't the same. At that time, I remember <clears throat> always coming back to this notion of how do we focus on keeping people safe? How do we protect 
the least of these, those who are most vulnerable in this particular situation. And I think that, you know, regardless of situations, that's always something that the church ought to be thinking about. Who are the most vulnerable among us? What are the dangers out there? What are the things that we can affect for good or for bad? And I have to say, God was with us then, just as God is with us now. God is always with us, regardless of the difficulty of the circumstances. God is with us now as we face uncertainty, as the world seems a little bit stranger, as we sort of collectively hold our breath to see what's going to happen in the coming year. Our scripture today from the Gospel of Mark was most likely written just after a Jewish revolt against the Roman Empire. So as you know, during Jesus' life, he didn't know a free land. He always knew a land that was occupied by the Romans. He always lived under the threat of empire. So the destruction of the temple happened somewhere between 66 and 70 CE. Even in our wildest imaginations, it would be hard to, to see the world through the eyes of these early followers of Jesus, these early Christians, the Jewish folks who lived there in this community, whose lives became shattered in this moment. The destruction of the temple was more than just a building for them. This was thought at the time to be sort of a sacred heart of the world for the Hebrew people. One thing we often see as a common response throughout the Bible is that when death-dealing forces seem to have the upper hand, that's when the prophets and the writers get to work. That's when they write these apocalyptic texts that we see in the Old Testament and some of these sections here in the New Testament. Apocalyptic from the Greek root word, apocalypsis, it means uncovering or revealing. Uncovering or revealing. It's with this backdrop that the story of Jesus at the temple must have felt painfully visceral to those early Christians. In fact, the entire Gospel of Mark needs to be read with the destruction of the temple and the failed insurrection in the minds of those who hear it. As the empire of their day pushed them deeper into the dirt with the might of the Roman Empire, that was not a time when you could be free with your religious expression. There were secret signs that Christians would have with each other. I think one of them was making part of the, the fish and then the other person would make the other half of the Christian fish in the dirt. And they knew that if they made those signs that that person could be trusted. That person was, was somebody who was not gonna persecute them or turn them over to the, to the Romans as an insurrectionist. And even in this apocalyptic time, there is a message of hope in Mark's gospel. There is grace and goodness. If you look hard enough, even in the midst of chaos, there is goodness. Even in the midst of destruction, God is there. It's not that God wishes these things to happen. I think that's one of the common misconceptions we as Christians have. We think of these things as being God-ordained. It's not that God wishes chaos or destruction or evil to happen, but rather these destructions and these evil moments simply don't get to have the final word. Because our God is a God of love. Our God is a God of resurrection. Demonstrated by Jesus Christ. 
we're about to enter into a time of Advent, of waiting, of, of eagerly anticipating a time of birth, of celebrating the light in the midst of darkness. This passage today that we read is often thought of as the Markan apocalyptic text because Jesus echoes the past prophets like Micah and Jeremiah who also talk about their own communities being shaken to their core by the violence and the destruction of empire. All while looking toward the future, toward a time of restoration and hope because they know that God is on their side. Jesus even goes so far to frame these events as birth pangs. Again, not to say that God wanted the temple to be destroyed, but rather that this impressive building that served as the focal point of religious life during Jesus' lifetime wasn't the thing that God wanted the most. It was beautiful. It was impressive. Those stones were massive. His disciples were rightly impressed by them. But Jesus has to remind them, stones can fall down. God wants what's in here. What God wants from us is not our impressive buildings or our fancy outfits, but our hearts. Christ lives in every single one of us And every time we show kindness to a stranger, every time we consciously look around and see whose needs are not being met in our community yet. And then take strides to meet those needs. That's God's love and hope showing up. Regardless of how you may be feeling this week, I have to remind all of us that The coming year or years may be an uncertain and stress-inducing time, especially for those in the LGBTQI community. It wasn't that long ago that same-sex marriage was legalized. It wasn't that long ago that our military had a don't ask, don't tell policy that was meant to ensure that queer folk would stay in the closet while serving our country. There are folks who are legitimately afraid right now that their basic human rights will be affected either by laws repealed or by Supreme Court judgment. And so for us as people of faith who have committed ourselves to serving all of God's beloved children, regardless of who they love or where they come from, we need to remind each other in these hard moments, when they come, and they will come, that these moments are birth pangs, that God has not abandoned us. We will continue to love our neighbors. We will continue to consider them loved, beloved children of God, whether they are our enemies, whether they are our friends, whether they are our neighbors near or far, They are beloved. Jesus didn't tell his disciples about the temple's destruction simply to quell the sense of awe in its construction that would have been completed during his lifetime, but rather to remind them that God doesn't depend on such things. Our building here is wonderful. We love gathering in the space but it's not the truest sign of God's movement in our lives. How we react when bad things happen, that's when we see the fruit of the labor of our faith as the body of Christ. In a bit, we're gonna be singing a song uh, called Stand By Me. Not the popular newish one, the, the hymn. We're gonna sing the hymn, Stand By Me written by Charles Albert Tindley. Anybody hear of him? Annie knows him. He's sort of the the father of modern African-American hymnody. He was born in 1851 in Maryland, and his mother died when he was only two years old, so he was raised by his father. And despite these very humble beginnings, he eventually became 
a Methodist preacher, and was appointed to Bainbridge Methodist Episcopal Church in Philadelphia in 1902. It was the same church where he had previously worked as a janitor for years. And then he came back to be their pastor. Times were hard for those parishioners in Philadelphia, especially for the African-American community. As you can imagine, in 1902, what this country was like, what we were going through during that time. Persecution, economic hardship, and laws that were in place to, to make sure that black and brown folks did not have the rights that other folks did. In 1905, Tindley had his hymn, Stand By Me, published in a collection of hymns entitled, New Songs of Paradise. It's interesting that at first glance, if you, if you look in your hymnal at this hymn, it seems to be all about one person singing and and asking God to be with them in their personal struggles in the moment. With the hope and the promise of a time when they would overcome those storms by the grace of God. But something magical happens when you sing this song as a body. When we sing this song together, Stand By Me, suddenly sounds a little bit more like Stand By Us because we're all singing it together. Simply by showing up for each other, we are reminding each other every single week that God's love is unrelentingly present, even in the midst of storms or times of trial. And for that, I am incredibly grateful. Amen. So friends, we rise and we're gonna to sing together Stand by me, verses one, two, three, and five. Please come forward.
Merciful God, whose wisdom surpasses all of our understanding, we offer these gifts as a token of our faith and our devotion. In a world full of uncertainties, may these offerings be used to spread your hope and love. Teach us to listen to your voice amid the noise and to trust in your steadfast presence. Bless our giving, that it may build your kingdom right here on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I have a few uh, prayers here. Uh, this one is from Lorna. It's the joy for new hearing aids. It's wonderful. It's always good to be able to hear. This is from Mary Ayers, uh, please continue to pray uh, to keep Mary's sister Marge in your prayers. Uh, she's still in the hospital after having multiple seizures in the last month. Thank you for Marge. <laughs> Almighty and loving God, we give you thanks for this day. We thank you for the joy of, of being able to hear, the joy of being able to enter into this space, the joy of, of welcoming all of your beloved children, no matter who they love, no matter where they come from, we are thankful for the example of your Son, Jesus Christ. O oh God, as we think about those who are not here with us today because they are either sick or, or not well or are injured, we pray for wholeness. We pray for health. We pray for Marge that she gets some answers. We pray for those who are dealing with, with life-threatening diseases like cancer. We pray for those who are among us who are dealing with chronic pain. We pray for an ease to their pain, a, a, some comfort in their souls. We pray for your Holy Spirit to be among us and to be lifting up our spirits, even for those who are feeling lost and lonely and are feeling despair on this day. We pray that they would feel hope, that they would find those glimmers of goodness in community Oh God, we pray for all of the families uh, in the preschool during these, these months where it's getting colder and, and kids are getting more anxious and, and feeling cooped up. 
We pray for families right here in Snohomish that they would, would find ways to, to share coziness and goodness and that they would find ways to, to help somebody. Oh God, we know that we are, when we connect to you, we connect to all of those who are, who are seeking to follow in your ways. We're thankful for that, for being part of this grand body of Christ all around the world. Oh God, today we also pray for all those who are unhoused in our community, that they would find a roof over their head, a safe place to sleep, and have a warm meal, that they would feel cared for in this community. We pray for those who are immigrants, we're seeking a better life. Pray for safety. And oh God, we also pray for our, our friends around the world who may be in harm's way on this day because of war, because of violence. We pray for all those who are just stuck in the middle in these fights in Ukraine and Gaza and Sudan. Oh God, we pray for an end to the violence. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our rock, our redeemer, and our friend. Amen. My friends, we are bold, as we always are, to say the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we're gonna we're gonna finish up today with a song. We're gonna sing There'll Be Sunshine in the Morning. What's that? Hallelujah, Hallelujah that's right. Well, and I, I, I do also want to say, I'm gonna invite you to rise if you're willing and able. And if you feel like dancing, don't hold back on my account.
Thank you for being a church family. Now receive this benediction. May the spirit that leads you through the fire and the flood, the spirit that baptizes you with power, the spirit of expectation and hope, lead, strengthen, and guide you this week and always. Go in peace, friends. Amen.
Harris will have used the, the, the county that decided that she was going to write a letter for the North Carolina. Well, hey. Do you remind me, what are the three, three Wednesdays for Todd High School people in there? This coming. So this coming Wednesday, okay. And then we skipped. And the two before. The two before, the two, okay. yes. Yeah. 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 Every school. And the, the gal, nobody heard it. It was the If someone reports it to the officials, they now are obligated by the state to bring the captains together and the two coaches that the same as well. It happened twice during the pre uh, North Creek Arlington game. North Creek bottle coming for So it's right south of South Jackson, out there on the Seattle Hill, really. And um, so. They had to do that. They had to do it twice in the game because somebody reported it to them. If the official hears it, he can throw the flag. Unsportsmanlike conduct, they can kick somebody out. But you can't. I can't walk up to the referee and say, "He calls me a dirty so and so. He calls me a Swedish whatever." And you know, that's hearsay. You can't do it. Now, if I hear, if the official hears it, he can throw the flag. Unsportsmanlike conduct. Boom, you're gone. So if someone says, then they have to report it to. Bring the captains in. They have to report it to the game 